I would like to introduce Nadine Artemis, who is the author of Holistic Dental Care, The Complete Guide of Healthy Teeth and Gums, and the creator of Living Libations. We're going to be talking about toxins in the home, skin, and mouth, how toxins in the home, skin care, and oral care affect the human microbiome. Welcome, Nadine. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Um, so we're talking today, you know, about all this amazing um, things that families really need to know about because there are so many toxins in the home. And I don't think that many of us, when we first have our babies, we don't really think of that. We think of we want everything to be clean and we think of all these high chemical things to clean that. And then we start to learn that there's a better way. And so, you know, how does, you know, what we put on our skin affect our guts and and, and you know, how, do, how does that help and, and how does it hurt, you know, all the bacteria that's going around in our gut? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty dynamic how it all works. I feel like, you know, for a few decades now, we've understood that there's more pollutants on the planet and more toxins for our body to process. But what's really fasc- fascinating is the revolutionary research that's been done in the past decade about the human microbiome. So, You know, before we could comprehend how toxins would affect, uh, you know, our our body function, some could sometimes being fatal, fatal, sometimes it's a slow, uh, low dose daily buildup that can accumulate in the tissues and the bones and different organs like the liver. But what's fascinating now with the study of the human microbiome is that we're understanding how not just how we're affected on a cellular level, but on a bacterial level, because we now understand that the number of bacteria in our bodies is a equivalent, approximately equivalent to the amount of cells that we have in our body. So on one level, we're really these holobiont human hosts that are hosting a banquet of bacteria in our bodies. And this bacteria, the human microbiome is the name, the sort of umbrella term for all the bacteria that we house in our body and how these bacteria are actually essential for endless essential body function and to have you know a healthy functioning body we need our microbiome intact and so now what we're understanding is that a lot of these toxins in our home not only they are taking a toll on our cells and organs but they're also devastating the supply of bacteria in our body. So sometimes it's mutating it, sometimes it's making the species extinct, um, and sometimes it's weakening the beneficial bacteria and it's in a sense that allows the pathogenic bacteria to get a stronghold. And that's when our body functions can go off balance. And so many of us don't even think about, you know, the different skin care that we use. And, and we, do, we don't, I, I know I never did until after, you know, my son was diagnosed with autism and we learned about all the different toxins in the house and, um, and, and not just, you know, not just the things we clean with, but even the shampoos and the conditioners and, and the sunscreens and everything. And so I think that, you know, many families, unless you are forced to learn about it, often you aren't um, educated on this subject until you kind of have to be. Would you agree? Absolutely, yeah. Until you have to be or something just sparks a passion in your life that makes you want to sort of go down that road. And I think what's really neat is to sort of understand the inception of the microbiome because we can talk about like the, the home and the mouth and the skin and all those things, but really to understand like the root of how the microbiome just helps us be happy or, or how it can get disturbed. And, you know, our microbiome was really woven into us in our mother's womb. And it's sort of this flo- it's the flora of our body and it, it, it gets its initial inoculation. Our microbiome gets its initial inoculation going through the birth canal so that really our first steps of life are in these secretions in the vaginal canal and, and, the, and what is going on our skin, the, the bio, the bacterial, very core primal information that's being passed along on the baby skin as it's slipping out of the birth canal. And, um, you know, baby skin, which is sort of fresh from its nine-month nap in amniotic fluid, it gets covered in a waxy white vernix sheath. And that sheath is home to the maternal microbiome genome. So in today's rush 
to rinse the baby, um, this waxy sheath, which is really like a probiotic patina, gets removed from baby's skin. And babies born by cesarean are often more vulnerable because ambient bacteria, so that's the bacteria that's airborne in the, in the room, instead of the mothers, start to colonize their skin. So then this maternal flora, this maternal bacteria, which is sort of this, I like to think of it as a soul starter culture, it then further gets activated by the 200 prebiotic oligosaccharides that are found in breast milk. So then if we have a situation where there has been a cesarean and for unknown circumstances or you, know, um, or you choose to do formula feeding, um, we need to think about quality of formula because then formula feeding, classic commercial formula, it actually impairs microbial diversity as formula lacks the innate matter that can actually nourish the microbes. So then for many, what scientists are understanding today is they're really connecting the dots and finding out that these missing microbes, these missing species of bacteria, just right from the start of the birthday, have, are increasing things like risks of infection, allergies, skin disorders, and stomach disorders. And so that could be setting up even just the intestines to not be as robust as they could be genetically. And that's just from birth then. Like if you, if you didn't have a natural delivery or if, if, you were, if your own gut as a mother wasn't able to pass on um, the good guys to your baby is what you're saying. It, just, it can all manifest in different ways. You know, for somebody, it could just be a simple, you know, more susceptibility to acne. For others, it could be, you know, severe eczema or different, you know, there's been connections with asthma and allergies. So it's all going to manifest in different ways. And then it kind of gets, depends on what the baby skin has been inoculated with from the ambient bacteria as well. What, what do you recommend um, when the babies are first born? I mean, should we put probiotics? You know, what can we do if, let's say, you had to have a C-section, let's say it was an emergency? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. There's um, a lot of midwives know this today. There's a really good book by Dr. Martin Blazer called Missing Microbes. And he goes through studies and different um, protocols that they're doing around the world when people know about this. So you can ask your doctor or midwife or nurse. So if there is a cesarean section, they'll take a, one of the a gauzes, the sterilized gauze from the hospital, and they'll insert into the in the vagina and get it saturated. And then they will swab that on the baby's skin. And they're finding that those babies are, are getting a better sort of seeding, so to speak, from the friendly bacteria, the beneficial bacteria that they need. Um, so that's one possibility. And um, then also probiotics. And there's a really good book out by Dr. Perlmutter called Brain Maker. And in that book, there's a really good protocol section at the end, which goes through different protocols and different types of probiotics and different things that people can do, um, you know, not only right at birth when the baby's, baby's first born, probiotics during pregnancy and after birth. And that's that's really good stuff to know. Yeah, I've heard of people taking like a swab and like just swabbing the inside of the cheek of a baby with some probiotic. I, I thought, why didn't I know that when I gave birth to son? I wish I would have <laughs> oh. known that. It's like, oh, goodness. I did not read any literature on C-section <laughs> because I thought, well, I'm not having one, so why should I read about it? And um, <laughs> Unfortunately, my body had another, you know, uh, thought process because I ended up having to have an emergency C-section. Um, my baby was just too big, and I tried for 16 plus hours, 24 hours of labor. I uh, couldn't get him out, and um, I passed out. And I woke up, oh. and they were, um, you know, wheeling me off like one of those scenes in one of like you know ER kind of movie, you know, TV shows. And I, I vaguely remember a little bit of it um, because I was just so exhausted. Um, but gosh, do I wish I would have known then what I know now. I would have done things so differently. Um, and I just think, you know, for those families that are listening, that, you know, if, if you haven't, um, like, let's say you, you have, you're going to have another child or you have a friend that's going to have a child, please pass on this information because I wish they would just automatically do it in the hospitals, but they don't. And um, gosh, what a different yes. world we would live in if they did. <laughs> for, for sure. It's new. It's so new. You know, it's, uh, it's, I mean, the rate of cesareans is sort of new, the increased rate. 
is new. Um, uh, the understanding of the vaginal microbiome is new or just the baby's microbiome. So it's all new. And that actually makes me even think of, so if we're thinking pre-birth, preparing the baby for pregnancy um, or even preconception, there's, um, you know, a lot that can be done as well. And, and interestingly too, there's also a, a very clear connection scientifically between the vaginal microbiome, um, bacteria in the uterus and ovaries, that if they're off balance, that can affect things so, uh, so much as uh, fertil- infertility it can cause, as well as premature birth, um, which then even brings us back up to the oral microbiome. If there's gum disease, um, which again is connected to an off balance oral microbiome, then that can lead to preterm delivery as well. So, you know, and, and really this day and age, due to you know, probably a grandmother or mother that has, or yourself that has been on antibiotics. The average right now for uh, children in America is that by age two, a baby has on average had three courses of antibiotics. By age wow. 10, seven to eight courses of, of antibiotics. By age 20, 17 courses of antibiotics. By age 40, you're looking at over 30 courses of antibiotics for the average American adult. So we've got that in our own bodies and it could be generational as well. And, you know, there is a really good use for antibiotics. It's, it's, it's good that somebody did discover them. Um, but this sort of golden age of what we thought about antibiotics, we're sort of in a different time right now. And right now we have a huge issue about, you know, antibiotic resistance. And so again, the book Missing Microbes goes into this as well, as well as Dr. Perlmutter's book. But when we take those things, or if we had a UTI, UTI, urinary tract infection in the second or third trimester of pregnancy and took antibiotics for that, that is actually linked up to gut issues that can lead to things like autism. And, you know, there's like, again, I'm sure the jury's out on some of it, but I feel like there's enough evidence right now that it's something that we seriously need to consider is the health of our microbiome, you know, pre-conception, during pregnancy, at birth. And if you've missed those stages, what can be done, you know, at birth in the, in the toddler years? And this is why things like food, Food then becomes an issue because of it's, 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 you know, some people can handle gluten and corn and then some people can't. And that's really has to do with the intestines and the health of the gut. So that's why food allergy comes up. But really that's rooted back into not enough diversity of bacterial species in the microbiome. And again, our, like our bodies are just a microcosm for what's going on in the macrocosm of the planet. You know, we've got depleted soil, we've got depleted nutrients, we've got depleted bacterial diversity in the soil and the food. And so it's really all interconnected. But again, I feel like, you know, the easiest place is to start with our bodies and our homes and just learning more because a lot of this is really, you know, easy to incorporate once you kind of understand it. And you're like, so well, it's like, I always think of things, I think of the three things to do, which is stop, seed, i sorry, stop, seal, and seed. And we can really think about those three steps, whether it comes to, you know, our home and garden to our, or to our bodies or to our oral care. So we want to stop doing some things like, you know, using mouthwash that can kill off the bacteria, eating GMO foods or, you know, showering in chlorine. So we want to start or using like toxic cleaners in our home. So we want to stop doing some of those things, stop eating gluten or corn, things that are infecting our gut. And then we want to seal. So if it's about the mouth, it's about sealing the mouth, the very thin tissue in the mouth by not using things that are corroding the insides like sodium lauryl sulfate or heavy mouthwashes and different practices like that. Or we want to seal our guts by not eating food allergens that create microscopic uh, perforations in the gut, which is something called leaky gut. Um, Or with our skin, we want to stop sort of slathering on toxic chemicals that are disrupting the microbiome on our skin's surface. 
So we want to seal those areas by using things like beautiful jojoba or olive oil, using baking soda and sea salt to brush the teeth, you know, vinegar to clean the home and eating more real non-processed foods. So that's the sealing process. And then we want to think of seed, seeding. And so whether it's ingesting probiotics and prebiotics to work up that microbial diversity back in the body, um, you know, maybe we want to do some seeding of probiotics um, in the vaginal microbiome or reseeding our mouth, swishing with probiotics uh, and you making a, in water and making a mouthwash with that and then eating foods high in fiber that are prebiotic and then can feed the whole microbiome in the body. So it's stop, seal, and seed. And, you know, when you're talking about um, things like vinegar and, and things that, uh, baking soda, a lot of stuff, this is what our grandparents, our great-grandparents used. And I don't know why we stopped suddenly in the future generations, we, we suddenly stopped doing all the things our grandparents did because I was raised by my grandma and I remember her making all of our cleaners from scratch. I remember a lot of vinegar and water bottle sprayers, you know, throughout the house. And she would always say, this is the best way to clean. And, and you know, a lot of baking soda we used. And, and a lot of the things you're talking about, I feel like somehow we lost track of what we used to be like. Would you agree? Yeah, it does seem like we've lost track. <laughs> Luckily, though, now we, we, there's so many options and you can easily Google in about one second how to clean your home with vinegar <laughs> and baking soda. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny because, you know, we have a bottle I, uh, here at my home with vinegar and, and uh, water and people sometimes look at me and I'm just so used to always having that, you know, just from growing up that I didn't think anything different about it. But yet, you know, other people were just so used to the convenience of just grabbing, you know, cleaners. Although today there are cleaners that are non-toxic and, you know, that really support the environment and, and don't, you know, leach out all the things that we're, you're talking about right now. Not that many of them, but there are a few out there um, for those that don't want to home make their science projects at home. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think this is such a great topic. Now, can you tell us a few things um, and products or ingredients that are unhealthy for us? Because I know that's kind of confusing when you do look at all the different labels of, you know, what does that even mean? Oh, yeah. And I think on one level, the list is kind of endless. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you, there's so many. But for the body, for the body, because I, you know, I do, I'm, because we make a skincare, I just am so fascinated with health and beauty and I just find they're so inextricably linked. So things like parabens, that's a common preservative um, that's in every, pretty much every single beauty care product. And um, it's very disrupting to the endocrine system. Then there's things like surfactant which are the things that make things suds. And things like sodium oral sulfate can create, um, you know, leaky gums in the mouth. They can create uh, bleeding gums. It can irritate the skin in the mouth. And then the, the sodium oral sulfate um, also is in a huge family. It's of the laurel sulfate. It's in, it includes ammonium laurel sulfate. Um, so it's ALS. LES and ALES are all the things you might see on a label. And they're all actually skin irritants. So they will disrupt the skin's microbiome as well, leading to things like acne or lodging um, surfactants into the top layer of the skin, the stratum corneum, even after rinsing. Those things will remain. And now through the study of the microbiome and some special photography, they can see, they've asked people to, you know, do their normal body care routines and then they take this special photography after three days and it's still on the body. Like you can still see the residue of the shampoo, of sunblock, of all the different body care items that were used. They're wow. still staying on the epithelium and while toxins just dribble into our pores, like the things like the methylparabens. Um, you know, and you can find so many stats on how methylparabens disrupt our bodies in so many different ways. And when I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, really fascinated by breast health and keeping and women's health. So keeping that whole area very healthy and happy and uh, interesting research on parabens with breast health is that 99% of cancerous breast tissue was found to contain parabens. So that's like, you know, the deodorant that's put on daily for decades, um, which also then includes other issues like aluminum. So what happens there too in that area is because, you know, when we wear bras 
and because that's such a high lymphatic area with the armpit. And then bras kind of cut off uh, circulation in that area. So there's more of a toxic buildup that area because it's not getting circulation. So two easy things that women can do is as they're moisturizing their body, they can also do breast massage and that helps to get circulation going in the area. It's nothing fancy. It's just sort of spending a few more uh, moments, awareness, massaging that area with, um, you know, botanical oils. We make a breast massage oil or you can just use, make your own or use coconut oil or olive oil. And then for, instead of using toxic deodorants and also one that is to use something that's so effective is, is just the essential oil sandalwood. You would just take one drop, put it in each armpit and uh, you're, you're pretty smelling pretty beautiful for a couple of days. We combine essential oils with sandalwood to do all these different flavors. So we make these things called underarm charm and poetic pit. So those are really fun, but you can just use sandalwood or baking soda also works well. You can just dust some baking soda on or you can uh, mix it with some coconut oil and sandalwood or, you know, lavender, a favorite essential oil, and then use that as deodorant. Also, sunning armpits helps them smell better too. So there's so many simple, easy things so you don't have to use all these chemicals. Um, then there's, you know, the colors and pigments, which are, you know, like the dyes that are in foods and skincare. You know, th- those have history of causing hyperactivity, and they also contain heavy metals that can accumulate in uh, the bones and tissue of our body. And then just common tap water can be irritating for uh, many body systems, including the skin, because they can, it, common tap water contains fluorine and chlorine. And there's different websites that can tell you about the tap water in your area and different reports that have been done because now the additional issue we have with tap water besides the chemicals that are used to clean it or perhaps the corroding pipes that it's being sent through, uh, there's also a high amount of pharmaceuticals including antipsychotic medications, birth control pills, and heart medications. Wow. And another top uh, chemical irritant is fragrances. So when you see the word fragrance, as an ingredient on a bottle, that one word uh, that represents the ingredient in that bottle, that can contain up to a thousand different ingredients to make that singular fragrance. And a of thousand course, it, different ingredients for just to say fragrance? Yeah, for the word wow. fragrance. It can. It, I mean, it could have, it could have a hundred. Yeah. Like a hundred too many. You, you never think of that though, you know? My goodness. No, these are the... Use the backdoor secret to label reading. <laughs> oh, that's scary. <laughs> it's amazing yeah. that you, it's really amazing that this isn't on the five o'clock news. I think, and also, why is it allowed? You know, like how come they're allowed to, to do that? Because most consumers don't, you know, don't know this. And like I said, until it's either too late or they're they're trying to figure out how to become healthy or healthier and seems like they shouldn't be able to just put fragrance or fragrances and not tell us exactly what it is. Because I'm sure if they listed all 27 million things, we wouldn't be buying it. <laughs> well, there would be no room on the bottle because the words could be those, all those long and unpronounceable words. You know, and yeah, it's hard to say how it got like this. But I mean, you know, the, the, the you know, there's a, oh, approximately 80,000 chemicals that have been created, synthetic chemicals. and they are innocent until proven guilty. And of those 80,000 chemicals, only a handful have ever been completely banned, like PCBs or uh, the name is escaping me. Starts with a D um, and it was sprayed. It used to be sprayed everywhere. Um, but anyway, I mean, you know, I, I feel like I'm sure, you know, if we took every single 80,000, you know, all those 80,000 chemicals and then tried to gather evidence and studies that were done on each one. And then if you look at who conducted the studies, was it the company themselves? Or if we were able to do that kind of detective work, um, I'm sure we'd still find like, well, I'm sure there'd be ones that we'd be like, oh, they're, they're clearly that totally toxic chemical or they're one be like, we don't know. But I feel like really, I think we can say, even though they, all the chemicals have varying degrees of toxicity, 
their chemicals are certainly, synthetic chemicals are not harbingers of health. And so, you know, I think I'm going to generally walk on the side of caution, do what I can in my home. And because, uh, you know, I know that cleaning with apple cider vinegar is safe. I know baking soda has a history of safety. Um, so that's, that's the side I'm going to err on until, until proven otherwise. <laughs> now, what made you so passionate about what you're doing? Um, well, I was always really passionate about um, blending and working with botanicals. And in grade nine, I started to, I made uh, uh, Laird de Tom perfume using essential oils. So I did like a real version of it for a science fair project. And then I was in university. Um, it's, it really was triggered by and uh, really being at university and, and uh, really getting into making my own food. And I had skipped uh, university that day and I saw a show that had like Lisa Benet on it and she was talking about you know uh, not eating meat I had heard of vegetarians before obviously in that time but what was fascinating to me was to hearing all these environmental reasons and health reasons and it was just like a whole exploration of food that I'd never heard of so Within a month, I had researched like so much about um, the supermarket and the system that provides food for the supermarket and canned food, processed food, and really understood food. And having lived a teenager life, like just filled and very passionate about mixing perfumes and even making lipstick and eyeshadow and all this sort of stuff. I mean, totally with normal commercial products, but getting excited about alternatives that were popping up like the body shop. So once I sort of understood food and then was fully diving into never eating processed manufactured food again, I also understood that the whole beauty care industry was pretty much a foundation that was similar to the whole food system. So then I was obviously disillusioned with my pineapple face wash after I really understood the ingredients. So it wasn't really I, pineapple. <laughs> it was not even close, never even saw a pineapple. So then I, I just, uh, again, within that same couple months, I then totally went into only making my own body care after that and exploring essential oils and finding distillers. And then when I got at the university, I opened up a, a store within the first six months of graduating. And it was Canada's, I mean, North America's actually first full concept aromatherapy store we had a blending bar and you could buy oils by the drop and perfume. And then um, I evolved out of that and then created our current incarnation of our business, which is Living Libations with my husband. And, um, and here I am, you know, wow. many, many years later. <laughs> well, you definitely had a calling and you definitely knew what you wanted to do at a very young age. And what an amazing journey that it took you you know, from here to there to back here and back there again, you know, and, and how wonderful for you to not just, you know, love what you do, but have a passion for what you do and also to be able to help so many others because many of us didn't start at age nine making our own, you know, perfume. <laughs> You're talking about, you did, you mentioned somewhat about the stop, seal, and see. Do you want to elaborate any more on that? Yeah, I think if we look at it generally, um, it's just a good thing to keep in mind and you can really apply it to all the little areas. So we want to stop using synthetics and harsh cleaners that are harmful to our cells and bodies and to the friendly flora that are really wanting our bodies to function. So this, the bacteria, I mean, like the discoveries about the human microbiome, like just seem to proliferate every day and so we now know that when we have healthy happy, happening gut bacteria vitamins that our body doesn't like normally store like vitamin c or vitamin k we when healthy back, back, blah, gut bacteria can actually make things like k2 and vitamin c which is all new so we know we want to stop inhibiting what's allowing our microbiome to function. So if, if the toxicity to the cells, you know, didn't light a fire under you, <laughs> then now with the understanding of, of our human microbiome, hopefully that will. And this is, I like to, I find this is a really good example too of really helping to clarify why glyphosate, the type of uh, cre created by GMO company, like one of the worst, 
herbicide pesticides. I'm sorry, I don't know the exact classification, but I kind of grouped them together. So a glyphosate pesticide, which is, a, and I believe it's an invention of Monsanto, they claim that the issue is um, that it, it helps to kill weeds. The action it uses to kill weeds, it's called the shikimate pathway, and that doesn't exist in humans or animals. So the glyphosate, the toxicity and um, probable carcinogenity of glyphosate should not affect humans and animals. However, the billions of bacteria that reside in our, collectively on our skin, in our mouths, and in our guts, each single bacterium contains a shikimate pathway. Wow. And I'm, I know so, people, they're listening, they're just going, I know their minds are just blown going, okay, I'm going to look at every single ingredient. And hopefully you guys start making a whole bunch of your own stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that is why, like, that, you know, you do not want to eat any food and you need to know what food had a glyphosate in because you're literally ingesting a pesticide. And we have this internal flora. We have a whole ecology going on in our body that we're like spraying not obviously spraying but you know with we're, we're killing off through ingesting that Goodness, that's why it's really important oh it's so important now when you look at um when you talk about sealing what do you mean by washing you're talking about um earlier you talked about some of the the sealing of the skin and, and the oils and, you know, making, uh, you know, whole foods to encourage, you know, all the good, good bacteria, you know. So when you're looking at that, when, when you're talking about washing and, and brushing oils, what do you mean by that? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I think, um, you know, there's a, a lot of doctors will talk about the high, hygiene hypothesis. So it's like we went, we got too clean. We kill so like an antibacterial soap. Oh, such a good example. So you can think of antibacterial soap, but you can also apply the same metaphor to like the stuff that we're cleaning our floors with. If it's really harsh, or the the very strong toxic mouthwash that it, we're swishing around in in our mouth, um, trying to get it too clean, but not realizing we're killing off the good bacteria that we need to keep our mouth in balance. And um, so antibacterial soap actually challenges our immune system because it disrupts the microbiome of the skin and we lose the bacteria that are enabling our skin's microbiome. Our skin's microbiome is a huge part of our immune system. So when we use antibacterial soap, we're cleaning off the good guys as well, the good bacteria. And so you can get, you know, if you just really scrub your, you just use classic like hand soap, hopefully not as the toxic kind, just like a handmade bar soap and you scrub your nails, that is, and you know, you scrub, it's the action of the scrubbing, like the movement of the hands under the hot water that's very helpful. So that's like, we got to rethink clean because we've been like killing off what's going to make us function. And um, so I think antibacterial soap is such a good, good, thing because that is not sealing your skin that is like the exact opposite of it so body brushing helps but also not using we don't want to use soap all over our bodies just pits and privates other than that you know you wash your face with oil it helps with acne it seals the skin it doesn't disrupt and lodge in surfactants underneath the skin you know we over shampoo we're over cleaning and that is like what they call the hygiene hypothesis so we're cleaning our way into sickness well, because we're cleaning off the good stuff and the bad stuff. And so we end up not replenishing any of the good stuff, it seems like, especially when you're talking about the hand sanitizer, even mouthwash. Um, you know, the hand, hand sanitizer, I feel like it's just so overused. And a lot of people don't even wash their hands anymore. It seems like they just use hand sanitizer and they don't even I know, and then we're water. just swishing around that gel. I'm always like, Ew. Yeah. and then your <laughs> hands don't even feel clean. It's so gross. No. Like, no, and the I really don't. cool thing about essential oils through all this because I will use essential oils to like mop my floor with. So lemongrass there, I use them to brush my teeth and uh, I'll use them in all the beauty care products. Of course, I'm only using totally authentic distillations and when they're real and we get all ours from different distillers around the world, 
But the really neat thing is, is that they are such a, they're such a beautiful extraction of botanical matter. They, there's an aroma that's just so otherworldly, you know, from frankincense to cinnamon to rose. They're all so beautiful. They're also really potent and they have great antibacterial, antifungal, and antiviral properties, but they only seem to disturb the pathogens. And what they do is they inhibit the communication of the pathogens. It's called quorum sensing. And study after study on various essentials and of course, essential oils, and of course to varying degrees, like clove might be more effective at quorum sensing a type of bacterium, a pathogen more effective than something like, like um, black spruce, but then black spruce might take care of these other rare um, a rare species. So there's a whole interaction that would be pretty much impossible to map out. But generally what, what we can see is that essential oils, um, so they inhibit the, the quorum sensing of the pathogens and that's when they group together and they start communicating and growing and making biofilms in the stomach and then, or in the, on the plaque, on the teeth. So essential oils can come and disrupt that, but they actually work with the, be the beneficial bacteria. So they don't disturb the beneficial bacteria, yet they tidy up the pathogens. So they're actually really something that is so needed during these modern times where we've killed off diversity. We've got some mutated bacteria that are a little getting a little out of control. And so we have the, 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 the diverse and the re realness of, this, of these botanical extracts that protect us in much the same way that they protect the plant. And so they're really fascinating to work with. And then now we know why, why we've been using things like cinnamon, clove, neem, frankincense, peppermint, mastic for thousands of years for something like oral care. Or now in a modern application, why in Europe, because overuse of antibiotics is huge in agriculture and, uh, and in animal feed because they're trying to spread, I mean, stop the spread of, of bacteria and viruses from factory farming. And so now essential oils like oregano in Europe are being added to the chicken feed instead of antibiotics. Wow, that's great though. We, we want good stuff added, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so what, now what, when you're talking about the oils, um, you know, I've never, I can't believe this, I've never heard to clean my home with essential oils. I've heard of oh, know, yeah. the, the basic vinegars and, and the baking sodas and stuff, but so you're using actual, like, um, uh, you know, the essential oils, like a couple of drops, like in water. Explain that. I, I'm, I'm trying to picture it. Yeah. I don't that's that. where the fun came. That's where you got, you got your basics. You got your baking soda and apple cider vinegar, and now you can have some fun. So to mop water, you could add a few drops of lemongrass or black spruce. You could make a countertop cleaner with um, just water, and you just do like um, half a teaspoon of a, of a real, uh, a true uh, type of, uh, sorry, dish soap, you know, like a really look at the ingredients in the health food store and don't buy any that are scented and then add your own because most of those don't have real, real, real essential oils in them. And, but you're just going to use like a tiny, like a half a teaspoon and you're going to add about five drops of whatever you want to that, but it will help add to the cleanliness of it. So you could do like thyme and blood orange or basil and lemon, or, you know, you can make whatever you want and you can use that to clean your windows and your door handles and your toilet flushers and your light switches and you can just get things cleaner. Or what we also do is then we also have like an alcohol version. So we'll take like an organic vodka and then we'll add some really potent cleaners to that, like oregano, thyme, lavender, and then we'll, we'll use that as sort of the disinfectant, um, you know, where we're doing door handles and stuff that we wouldn't be using to clean wood, for example. But the water bottle with a teeny touch of soap you could use to clean wood surfaces. So, you know, the applications are endless. Your house must smell, sm your house must smell so good. <laughs> with all the it does. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Uh, is there a, a certain type of um, essential oils that are better than others? Like how do we know, let's say we go into the health food market or we go, go online, how do we know which essential oils to buy? Because I'm assuming they're not all created equal. Or maybe they are, I don't know. No, they're certainly not. Um, you know, the bulk of essential oils on the planet are created for the food and flavor industry and really come from barrels and sort of, uh, barrels of oils in the New Jersey warehouses that feed, you know, huge productions of 
flavoring orange juice and cigarettes. And there's a whole thing going on there. And that's a whole other story about adulteration and nature identicals and oils. And so a lot of, unfortunately, the brands that you'll see that are popular, there's third-party testing that's done and they show that these oils have adulterants in them. Like not the peppermints got things that aren't real and so on and so forth. But there's uh, plenty of really true um, companies out there. And, you know, I've been researching and getting my oils from my own distillers for over 20 years. So you'll want to know things like the Latin name. And I encourage people to smell all different types of oils and brands because then you will have sort of a scent repertoire built up in your head and you will start to really go, oh, yeah, that oil that frankincense oil that they're promoting is all real. When you really smell a different one, you're like, it's got to be watered down with something. So then you just start to know. Um, so you just want to look for, you know, information and work with companies that you can really trust. Uh, you want to get through the hype in the marketing. As with most things in life these days, you want to get through that hype and marketing. Well, hopefully um, the people listening today, hopefully we've saved them from some of the homework um, by just learning some of the basics um, because, gosh, going to the market these days, it's not just about buying, you know, just the food you need to eat and the the cleaners and and the toiletries you need, but now you have to educate yourself. It's not like you say, oh, I just need some shampoo and conditioner or, oh, I just need some cleaner for the floor. Now it's like, oh, gosh, I have to learn all about this and all about that because I'm still blown away that fragrances could mean a thousand or hundreds or whatever, just not one thing, you know? It could mean so many more. I mean, to me, that just, that should be a crime. (laughs) They should not be allowed to do that. (laughs) We have so much on our plates as it is. It's like, now they're going to, now anytime I see fragrances, I'm not even going to touch it (laughs) because I'm... Yeah, it's so not real. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Now, how do people find out more about you? I mean, I know that people are listening going, I want, I want to know about our book and I want to know about our website. How do they find out more about the work you're doing? Well, um, we're at livinglibations.com and we have, uh, of course, all our usual media outlets like Facebook, Living Libations, Instagram, Living Libations. Instagram is my favorite one to connect on, um, and Twitter and Pinterest and YouTube, there's videos and the book is available on our site. And of course, it's also so easy to get on amazon.com. Wonderful. Is there any final messages that you want the parents to, to know, um, from our talk today? Yeah, I think like sometimes it will obviously it can be overwhelming, especially if this information is new or it might sound like, Oh no, I got to re like look at my bathroom, my kitchen and my cleaning cupboard, but really it's fun. And when you're there, it's so simple. And then you're really feasting at a whole other banquet of beauty. And it actually, it may seem awkward at first, but it's really just celebrating life more and, um, you know, it becomes simpler and easier and nicer and better smelling. And And your skin will be happy and your teeth will be happy, you know. (laughs) I think that's wonderful. And on your website, um, there's probably lots of tips and tools that you probably give um, uh, there as well, correct? Yes, tons. Yeah, I think I think it's kind of like this is how I think of it at least. You know, why do we buy the cleaners that we first buy? Why do we buy the foods that we first buy? You know, it's kind of like when you go off to college, you go to the the market and you know you buy the same things that you 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 were used to seeing at home. You don't even look at the other brands because you know in your mind that was the, the product you picked up, right? Whether it be whatever it was to clean the floors or whatever it was to you know clean the windows. And I think that just trying to 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 retrain yourself. And so eventually you'll be, instead of going to the store to buy this particular cleaner, you'll be going to the store to buy the essential oil. And it won't be that extra thing. It's just kind of a learning curve in the beginning. But once you learn it, it does sound really fun. And I think I'm just visualizing, you know, trying to figure out what your house smells like. But I bet you, you just must wake up so happy. It just must smell so yummy when people come over. It but does. Thank you, so, thank you so much for taking the time and um, in really talking about a subject that's so important. And I think that you were able to tell our families in such an easy way to digest. And it doesn't sound scary at all. It actually sounds like something that maybe a group of moms um, can go together to the market and, and kind of have fun trying to find new ways uh, to create some of the stuff you talked about today. Yeah. Thank you so very much. And for all you guys listening, uh, thank you guys for listening.